This is Book TV's Afterwards, this week from our archives, a discussion with Joe Ricketts on his book, The Harder You Work, The Luckier You Get, an Entrepreneur's Memoir. He'll be interviewed by former Wall Street investment banker, William Cohan. Joe, uh, thank you for being with us here today. And uh, this is a heck of a book. Uh, I really enjoyed it. Uh, It's a gripping story and well told. And uh, so I guess my first question for you is, why did you decide to write this now? Is this just restless Joe Ricketts syndrome uh, or... Was there something more you wanted to say, you know, at this point? What, what motivated you to do this now? Well, first of all, let me say thanks for uh, this interview. <clears throat> but I'll tell you, now it was written to appeal to entrepreneurs, to let young entrepreneurs know how hard it can be and how rewarding it can be. So uh, that it really offers encouragement to people to uh, think, hey, if I want to start my own business, I I should do it. The other thing, I I wanted to do it before I got too old and didn't remember everything because looking at this change from when the the SEC really kind of dictated to the New York Stock Exchange to get rid of fixed commissions and then going through all the technology was uh, really an inflection point in our financial service industry. And I wanted to tell the story from the inside so people would see a human aspect to it. So, so the title, the, the Harder You Work, the Luckier You Get, uh, is that tongue-in-cheek or do you, do you really believe that? I really, really did believe it uh, because it happened to me so many times. I, I think uh, Sam Goldwyn was the first one that really kind of put that phrase together, but as I was talking to the people at Simon & Schuster, you know, I would tell them, here's a problem, we work so hard, and of course it's in the book time and time again, Uh, the harder you work, the luckier you get, uh, just came out and and, uh, that sounded like it should be a good title. But I mean, there was an amazing amount of hard work that you went through, and I don't think, you know, as somebody who has written a lot about uh, uh, the financial industry, who worked on Wall Street for close to 20 years, myself, uh, uh, you know, the story you tell about building Ameritrade uh, and how hard it was, uh, was truly gripping. And, and I don't think, uh, you know, and I've written uh, books about the history of Lazard and Bear Stearns and Goldman Sachs, uh, and I never got the impression uh, in writing those histories that, of course, I didn't live through it, uh, uh, that it was ever sort of as tough as you experienced in building Ameritrade. How did you do it? Well, one of the things that made it tough was lack of capital. I mean, we, uh, we started with, uh, with almost nothing. In fact, when, uh, you know, back in the 70s, we had to send out a financial statement every six months to our customers, and, and one of our customers called me and said... Uh, I thought I had to tell you that you left three zeros off of your net worth. <laughs> I had to tell him, no, no, that's those are the real figures that you're uh, seeing there. So we could only grow by the capital that we left in the business from our profits. So we also had to be careful about running the business so that we're within the regulations of calculating our net capital and, and uh, stay within those regulations. So it was a constant struggle of balancing our income. First of all, making sure we had an income and then balancing it in three areas. How much money can I put in advertising? How much money do I need to make sure that the increase in the business is not going to exceed our net capital? And uh, how much can I put into hiring new employees and and, uh, buying new equipment for them to use? That That was a difficult balance for many, many years. And, that, and it sounded like, go ahead. And I was going to say, that's what really allowed us to grow uh, as, as well as we did. But even after being in business almost 20 years, when I saw the opportunity for the Internet and, uh, and the opportunity for advertising, I, I said, we don't have enough cash, we don't have enough money, and we're not going to make it with internally generated funds. We're going to have to go public. 
So uh, that was at the time when I regrettably said, if we're going to stay in this industry and be one of the winners, we're going to have to uh, have uh, some more capital. And it provoked us to go public. So obviously that is a momentous decision in any company's lifespan. Uh, you know, you spoke about the uh, momentousness of the Big Bang, you know, when fixed commissions went away and what that meant for your business. You know, in my own writing and research and experience on Wall Street, really one of the mo- most important moments in the history of Wall Street was when firms started going public. Uh, and it went, they went from being private partnerships to public companies. Obviously, it made access to capital a lot easier. But, you know, where, how do you feel? I mean, it sounds like you had some regrets about going public, but you had to do it uh, for, the, for the capital access. And the same thing could have been said about Goldman Sachs. Was something lost uh, when you all went public in your mind? And how important do you think this idea of companies uh, in, in, on Wall Street going public is to the way it changed the culture of Wall Street? For us, for me, it was a very difficult decision because I had always wanted to leave a business for my family to operate after I could retire and I was gone. And I knew that if we went public, it was going to be difficult to maintain the atmosphere of a family business. But at the same time, I also knew that we needed the access to that capital in order for us to take advantage of the opportunities that were ahead of us. And that turned out to be right. My, I, I kind of figured we need $100 million for technology and $100 million for advertising. And both of those figures turned out to be low. Uh, so uh, we went public just at the right time to get the right amount of capital to get uh, us into that, what I'm, for lack of a better term, the upper echelon of the people that were going to be able to uh, stay in business. At one time, we had over 400 competitors, but uh, most of the people were weaned out before, uh, you know, the late 1990s. A very similar story to the automobile industry or, or really kind of any industry. And I was aware of that. I knew that if we wanted to stay small, we were not going to be able to survive, and I would not have anything to leave to my children. At the time that we went public and I got all the blessings of having that capital and was able to compete, I knew that we were not going to have the same intimate atmosphere that we'd had in the past. Uh, People really felt close, as I describe in the book, uh, about working at Ameritrade. And um, it, it was really kind of a very fun environment, even though it was very stressful and people had to work hard. Everybody seemed to enjoy it. When you go public, you really kind of become a, a different company. You become, for lack of a term, more professional. You lose that personal touch that you feel when you're in a, a, a private company. I have a different attitude toward the investment bankers. I don't think they should have ever gone public. Um, I think they had better control and management of what they were doing as investment bankers when they stayed private. But I, so I see dealing with the public in, in uh, um, retail buying and selling and being an investment banker really is, is two different businesses um, and need to be uh, really kind of thought of separately. And I always thought the investment bankers should have kept it in a partnership and, and kept it private. Whereas on the public side, it was, it was when you're dealing with customers, I think it was okay. We, we really did well by uh, going public. It was us personally as a family that lost. So I, I certainly agree with you on, I think, on balance about the, uh, the idea that investment bankers should have stayed private. However, of course, you know they were getting into so many other businesses. So obviously, you know, Morgan Stanley had a big brokerage arm. In fact, your old firm, Dean Witter. Uh, uh, and so they were in so many different businesses. Maybe it was inevitable and the the capital requirements were, you know, not that much different than, you know, a retail brokerage business. Did you feel that the underwriters who took you public did a good job? Was that an enjoyable process for you or uh, does that leave something to be desired? Uh, it left something to be desired. I, I was amazed. We had been in business for 20 years and uh, we couldn't get anybody's interest. We were going to have a small 
offering until we got to First Boston. And then they didn't understand our business, and they were not enthusiastic about really taking us public. They did it because they made some money, but there w- there wasn't any special enthusiasm for our stock. And after we had been public for a little while and demonstrated to the market what kind of growth we could have and our stock price went way up, the guys from First Boston said, why didn't you tell us? And I said, well, I tried to, I tried to, but you guys just wouldn't listen. You wouldn't buy into it. Uh, so it was amazing. For 20 years, we had been growing at a phenomenal rate, and nobody in the securities industry thought we were anything other than a startup business. Uh, that was all a surprise and a shock to me. Is that because you were in Oklahoma and not in New York or San Francisco? I, I think even if we were in one of the money centers, we probably I mean, still would have been would have been uh, thought of I'm in the Nebraska, same way. I'm sorry, that's quite all right. <coughs> a lot of people. Yeah, well, we're, we're close. We're neighbors. Uh, but even yeah, if no, I know. I, I I'm in Nebraska. <laughs> if if we were. Uh, Located in one of the money centers, one of the major metropolitan areas, I think that we probably would have been looked at the same way because the securities industry didn't want to think that we were competitors and didn't want to think that we were doing as well as we were. So I think they just really subconsciously ignored us. Hmm. But, I mean, you know, Omaha also had, of course, Warren Buffett, so it's not like they (laughs) weren't aware of uh, what was going on in Omaha. No, that that is true, but... What Warren Buffett does is so much different than uh, what we do that we were both in the securities industry but completely different. And I don't know if the Warren Buffett phenomenon would wear, would wear off on us. If you met Warren Buffett, do you know Warren yeah, we, Buffett? Oh, yeah. We live in the same neighborhood, and I've had a couple of business meetings with him over that period of about 30 years. Um, and, uh, you know, maybe I'll see him once a year or so at a, a fundraiser or uh, something of that sort. But, but his, he's in a completely different world than I am. Sure. Uh, I, right, but he, he didn't seek your counsel, you know, about buying the steak <laughs> Solomon Brothers or anything. Well, that, that, that's certainly correct. Certainly correct. So c- can we go back, because you're, you're, you know, you're, Childhood is so interesting, and growing up uh, in Nebraska is so interesting. Um, you know, you, you say in the book how, you know, you, you weren't interested in sports. You, you sort of had a very different outlook, even than your family, your parents. Uh, you had if different interests. Was that hard for you growing up to be somebody who seemed to be not interested in either the, the, the house-building business that your father was in or... Sports, you know, the typical things that kids growing up uh, were interested in? It was not hard. In fact, I, I had an ideal growing up period. Being in Nebraska City in the 40s and the 50s and the 60s was an absolutely wonderful place for young people to grow up. And my best friends, we still get together. We, we look back at that and say, you know, we really had it in uh, the most wonderful way. And we didn't realize it. We didn't know it. Now, with respect to uh, my father, my father was in business with his father. And uh, then when my grandfather died, my father uh, bought the assets from the estate. And my father would have liked me to have been in business with him. And in fact, he encouraged me to go to uh, engineering school. But I had no intention of going into that business. I had tried as a young person but you have to have some talent with your hands, and I, and I, and I don't have that talent with my hands. I, I couldn't conceive of the mechanics that are necessary to be a carpenter. You have to understand uh, how you should cut, where you should nail things, and things of that sort, and I, and I just didn't have that. The second part was that I couldn't wait to get out of Nebraska City, even though it was a wonderful place to grow up. When I became a young man, I was ready to go off for new adventures. So, um, although... My father would have enjoyed me coming into business with him. He knew that I was never going to do that. And, in fact, he even counseled me when he fired me. He said, Joe, you're you're just not going to make it as a good carpenter. You're you're good at working with your hands. So even though you would normally think that that would be a stressful time, he was comfortable asking me to leave the company, and I was comfortable saying, I'm happy that you're asking me to leave. I don't want to disappoint you. And I'm, I'm uh, pleased that you're not so disappointed. 
Um, some of the uh, the other aspects uh, about playing sports, no, I never did. I never did feel any shortcoming in myself for not playing sports. I tried to play sports, but I was all thumbs. I, it just didn't work. If I tried to catch the ball, I'd hit the ball would hit me in the face. And um, as I indicated in the book, I felt like a grown up. You know, when I was a little boy and I had a, ba- uh, a paper route, I would take my few dollars into the bank and go up to a teller and hand them my passbook savings account and my few dollars. And that grown up, that teller would take that information and write it in that passport. That really made me feel grown up. That was a feeling that I got that nothing else would replace. So working to make a few dollars to put into your bank account was probably the most important thing in my, my life as a, as a young man. My parents always encouraged me to work and save. Uh, they never encouraged me to play sports. Uh, so I always had a, a, a bent. Of course, my parents were raised in the Depression. You know, so you, a lot of times you have a, <laughs> a different attitude on what you should do with your work and with your dollars. So you talked about how growing up you had great freedom, but also responsibility. I had. Uh, that's, that, that feels like such an American concept to me. Uh, you know, and, and, and an admirable American concept. Well, thanks. I always did feel responsible to my family, to my mother especially. I didn't want to disappoint her and do things that she would uh, r- really consider to be something that would make her feel embarrassed. Uh, we always did understand from my mother that we, we had a certain place in the community and we needed to work to maintain that place. So although I had no idea of what was happening to me at the time, as I look back now, I can see that I always knew that I should be responsible, and, uh, but I always knew that I had the freedom to go anywhere and, and really do anything. So can you tell uh, the viewers, because I think it's a great story, the, the, the story of the family bull, uh, you know, I guess I don't know, oh, yeah. a few generations back. Yeah, I mean, that seemed to me a, a seminal moment, right? For, for that generation, it was. And it was a great lesson for me to learn when my mother told me that story when I was a, a young man or a boy. Uh, my grandfather was a successful farmer in Manly, Nebraska. And it's a small farming town. And uh, being a successful person in that community meant that your, the rows that you, were pl- that you plowed were straighter, the hogs that you raised got fatter, things of that sort. And, of course, um, the other thing is, is that the, the Catholic Church in that small town um, offered the first pew to the family that gave the most, the second pew to the family that gave the second most, and things of that sort. And my grandfather's family always had the front pew. They uh, always bought a, a new car every couple of years. The, um, my grandfather's mother had married a banker, and this was before regulations or anything of the sort. So being a banker was like owning a hardware store. You lent your money, and you took your risk, and you put what interest rate on there that you thought would be the uh, something that would give you the a- adequate reward relative to the risk you were taking. But he uh, then had access to capital. So my grandmother wanted to leave each of her children a farm. Now, after the First World War, farming was a very successful business. It, it took a dip right after the war with extra supply on the market, but then the market grew as the economies around the world grew and had a demand for all the uh, agricultural products that the United States produced. And so during the 1920s, times were good. And so my grandfather had a farm on which they had a mortgage. And as soon as they had some equity in the farm, they borrowed against that equity to borrow the next farm for the next kid. As soon as they had some equity again, they borrowed against that to uh, buy for the third kid. So they built an inverse pyramid of debt. And if everything would have been continued the same, uh, it would have been just wonderful. But of course it didn't. We went into the Depression. Now, one of the things that my grandfather did do was uh, feed cattle. And uh, his dream was to leave a cattle operation to him and his son. So his dream was to have on the side of the barn a big sign that said Clarence Earhart and Sons. 
But uh, before his sons ever got very old, he bought this bull. Now, this uh, bull had uh, uh, a disease. I can't remember, tuberculosis or hoof and mouth disease. But it was a very prized bull, and uh, when he brought it home, he had a party. It was like a fair in his farmyard, invite all the neighbors in to see this new bull. And there was a number of tables that were taken from the house and put out in the yard. And uh, then everybody brought some food so that, you know, the tables were full of food and, and people would play games that they could make up. And uh, one of the games my aunt told me was uh, the uh, men would bet on how many eggs they could lay on the back of that bull before one of them started to fall off because it was big bull, big back. And uh, so my grandfather was in his heyday. This, this was the peak of his uh, career because he uh, was able to uh, show off this bull and think about the benefits that he could have in using that bull to uh, make his herd uh, get better, bigger and uh, better as far as the um, type of meat they would produce. When he got the decision from the state that uh, his animal had this disease, he lost all control. Then the state took control, and it was before current science knew how to handle it. So his whole herd had to be destroyed. Uh, And when his herd was destroyed, of course, he didn't have the money to make the payment on the loan, and that was like pulling the fulcrum out of the inverse pyramid, and everybody lost their farm. This was also before the days of of, uh, any kind of social welfare. So when he lost the farm... He moved to Nebraska City to go to work in the packing house. But he had a nervous breakdown, and so he never did work after he lost the farm. And my memories of him are sitting in a rocking chair just looking out the window. Now, his sons were old enough to go to work in the packing houses, and his daughters went to work. So the whole family went to work to support the family. But here's this man that had a very strong social position while he was a good farmer, and have to move into a house in Nebraska City that had dirt floors. They, they rented the, the least expensive thing they could find. Didn't even have any floors. You had to, it had floors like a log cabin. So it was uh, very much of a come down, and uh, it was uh, really kind of uh, hard times for uh, the family. And um, he, like I said, he never did recover. So uh, it was uh, something that had a big influence on my mother, and she told me that story many times. And, and did you take a lesson from that story I, for Ameritrade, for your I, own business? I, well, I did. I think, Bill, I always had to, had to say to myself, be ready to fail. Be ready to, to lose all of your dreams and start over. And, in fact, I've got a uh, website, entrepreneurscreatejobs.com, and one of the entrepreneurs in that website that I interview says entrepreneurs are different. We fail, and when we do, we get back on the horse. So as an entrepreneur, you've got to understand that 8 out of 10 new businesses fail and that your risk is really quite high. But if that happens and you're really an entrepreneur, you get back up and you, you try again. So another uh, important moment, if I get this right, is the whole story of the, the buzzsaw and the use of yeah. the buzzsaw in your father's business and what that taught you about the importance of innovation and technology. It, it is an important part of the story. And I, I really started out there and, and, and pointed out how important it was because after we were successful with technology, you know, around the turn of the century and we were big and successful, everybody thought I understood technology and uh, that understanding of technology is what allowed me to be successful. So, but the reality was I didn't understand technology. I just couldn't understand what it could do, like the buzzsaw. And that that buzzsaw image was where my mind went right after I got the idea. Hey, these people don't know. I don't know about technology. So how did I take advantage of it? And and my mind went right back to that uh, afternoon in that yard when my dad first used the, uh, the buzzsaw. And he was so pleased about what they could do. How much, how much more construction they could get done. So is this sort of the idea of you don't know, have to know how a car engine works, you just have to know what a car can do for you? That's correct. 
Same same thing. Uh, and I mean, it seemed again from 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 reading the book that technology was always uh, uh, a, a hurdle that you were trying to get over, uh, uh, and you thought you'd had a solution, uh, and then it would be obsolete by the time you implemented it, and a lot of money was spent, and a lot of people cycled through trying to figure out the technology, and, and it was as simple as you know the innovation of having people uh, be able to dial a phone number to make their trades as opposed to, uh, uh, you know, and do it sort of automatically. Uh, and it seemed like, you know, every time you thought you had the edge on the technology, uh, it kind of let you down and you were behind the eight ball all over again. Is that right? That is correct. But it is amazing to me to think where we started. We started with a touchtone telephone, the latest technology in 1975, and uh, a pencil and a, a piece of paper for an order sheet. And when we got a trade made, uh, you know, we recorded it in the book as a trade for that day. Then we put it on a ledger sheet, which went into an alphabet uh, system in a, in a bin. So it was, as I said in the book, it's just right out of Charles Dickens' days. I mean, it, everything was done by hand. It didn't take us long to learn that we could not continue to do everything by hand and expect the business to grow. And, of course, we all wanted the business to grow and saw that opportunity. So we had to have some sort of automation uh, come in to uh, help us out. And as I describe in the book, the first company that we used was a company by the name of Computer Research, and they gave us a a teletype machine, which was like a great big uh, typewriter, where our clerk would type in all the activity for the day, the trades that were made, the monies received, the money checks going out, things of that sort. And that machine then perforated a tape, like a ticker tape, and uh, we would then uh, set our telephone in a holder, and the ticker tape was hooked up to the uh, holder, so it would give the beeps and the bops in information to the computer in uh, Philadelphia. So we're in Omaha. All of this transmission it goes to uh, Philadelphia. Now, if you had some static on the line, ah, the information was incorrect. So the company in Philadelphia would uh, receive the information that we sent, process it, and print it out in Chicago. So all of our ledger sheets, all of our confirmations, all of our statements would be printed out in Chicago. In Chicago the person that ran those machines would put them in a box and send it to us in Omaha. So all of that was to happen overnight. Very seldom did it happen overnight. Something always happened. There was a snowstorm or something prevented it. So we usually got it a day after we were supposed to get it. Then we had to go through and pick up all the mistakes and get get it corrected. So it was a a much, much more efficient way for us to operate, but there was also a lot of opportunity for us to have mistakes And uh, in some ways, it was uh, very, very inefficient because we were ready to do the business of that day, which is answer the telephone and write the tickets and not have to spend our time trying to go back through the business we did two days ago and and correct the errors. So it wasn't too long after we'd had that business. And I got to tell you, I'm very happy that we had it. It was a, a good stepping stone. But we realized we needed to have our own system. But, you know, I had never heard the word software. So when people said, you've got to have a computer and and software, you know, the first question was, what is software? I mean, back in 1975, it's hard for people to realize that, you know, it wasn't all that long ago that uh, these things really came into being, and uh, the world was completely different at that time than it is today. So in the book, I I talk Uh, I'm sorry, go ahead. Oh, go ahead. I was going to say, in the book, I talk about Dave Kellogg, who was the genius that, that really put all of our software together. But if anybody thought that you were going to build a brokerage system from scratch, they would have said, you're crazy. And basically, if I, if I hadn't known Dave Kellogg, I would have never taken the risk. A huge risk. The fact that you could even get it done was amazing. 
So when I started to write this book and I started thinking about all the things that we did, I was amazed. Oh, my goodness, we did that. I forgot how much risk we took there. But Dave Kellogg was instrumental. Without him, we would not have been able to do it. And he did it really out of a challenge to himself. He wanted to do the impossible in in ways that uh, demonstrated that he could do things other people couldn't. You were going to ask a question? Could, 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 you know, could you have ever imagined that oh, we'd be with the technology where we are now, where essentially it's all done via the Internet through a website interface and you just can do your own trading right there online and it works and people feel good about it and there's confidence in the system? Could you have ever imagined that when you started oh, no. out? When we started in 1975, to have that, be an objective would be on our imagination. Nobody had the concept that you could do that. We took the trades by telephone, wrote them on a ticket, and then gave them to a clerk to uh, call in and, and get a uh, call back. Years later, when we could execute and report that execution back to the customer within six seconds, within six seconds, that was truly remarkable, almost like a miracle from our point of view. So everybody had to build their systems so that your order would flow through from the customer's keyboard to the exchange and back and make us have all the information or be aware of the information and let the customer know, that that was something that, to me, was truly remarkable, absolutely wonderful. But we didn't dream it. We didn't have any concept that that would happen in 1975. So, so why get into this brokerage business? I mean, I, I think you said something about seeing a magazine cover with a broker on the cover who looked dashing and impressive and prosperous and is that what did it for you i that yes that's part of it the other part was i wasn't too happy with my job i didn't i i was not excited about where my career was going and since i had been a reporter with dun and bradstreet i really kind of knew i wanted my own business but i didn't have any capital or any way to get any capital so being a commission salesman was the next best thing to have in your own business. And at the time that I went through this story of, of seeing the uh, cover of the magazine, it was a bull market and brokers were making a lot of money. And uh, so thinking that I could have the opportunity to put in my pocket my own compensation relative to a commission job and do it in, in uh, a way that is related to the uh, securities market, the investment market, was the most attractive I could get. So when I understood what happened, um, I, I had, to, had to go there. So I went to Omaha to apply for jobs, and I didn't have a college degree. And, and all the managers said, well, you know, we don't even look at somebody without a, a bachelor's degree. So that's when I, uh, my wife and I sat down to uh, map out how much money we'd need to uh, take care of the family and where I could go to work to make that money and how I could go back to school. And uh, then I went back to uh, college to uh, get my bachelor's degree. So uh, the uh, idea that I would be one of these people that flourish by making a lot of money as a stockbroker was incredibly attractive. Uh, But it just so happened that I got registered at the top of the market, you know, in the late 1960s, and then we had five years of a bear market. So how in the world do you go from being a a broker at Dean Witter to thinking you could start your own discount or, you know, low-cost brokerage firm and make it work? As as I uh, uh, talk about him, Bob Perlman, uh, my associate, my partner, my mentor, uh, he's the one that really said, somebody is going to break ranks and try to offer prices at a lower price because he was experienced with the grocery business and competition. So the brokerage community did not want to change. They didn't think it would change. So they thought even though the government had instructed negotiated commissions that people wouldn't really reduce their prices. And Bob Perlman is the one that said to me, oh, somebody will, and that'll start a trend. I I said, you know, it's clear as uh, everything. I I believe it. I understand it. So why don't we, if we think that we're going to have to compete for our business now on the commission that we charge, 
why don't we be one of the people that customers want to do business with and not have to defend ourselves to our customers for the high commissions that we always uh, uh, w- would have. So that's how it all got started. Uh, actually, we were as dumb as could be. We had no idea how to do it. Uh, we just had a lot of hope and uh, thought, oh, boy, that really sounds great. But uh, as the story unfolded, as I, as I really kind of tell in the book, it was piecemeal, a little bit here, a little bit there. But we were so, what do I want to, what's the word, naive or stupid enough to follow our dream that we just kept plowing along. And uh, it turned out to be that, you know, when you, when you think there is a market for somebody that just wants to make the trade, they just, they just want to let you know, here's what I want to buy, here's what I want to sell, and I don't need any research, I don't need any service. Uh, to find out that the market is bigger than you think, that was wonderful. The other thing that was really kind of important here was right after the uh, Second World War, we, uh, the government had the GI Bill. A lot of people came back from the conflict of the war to go to college on the GI Bill to become engineers, architects, accountants, uh, doctors, and they, with that education, felt comfortable in making their own decisions about what companies they want to buy stock in. So there was really two things that were going on at the same time that really made our market deeper and broader than, than we ever thought it would be. So uh, it's another one of those things, the harder you work, you're luckier you get. We didn't know that market was there until we got started. Well, it's, it's an incredible story of perseverance, too. Yeah. Uh-huh. Well, the other thing was I was poor. <laughs> you know, if I was going to leave this, what am I going to do? Uh, several times in the book, my back was against the wall, and I thought, well, I might lose it all here. But I always figured, well, yeah, I can go get a job. But am I going to be happy? No. I took the risk. I failed. I uh, just have to recover from it some way. Uh, so having your back against the wall really does help <laughs> because you really don't have any choice but to uh, keep going. There's also a certain uh, bittersweet quality about some of your relationships that you formed, like you mentioned Bob Perlman early on, and you know uh, you had to make tough decisions, and people came into the business, they left the business, uh, you had to make a lot of tough decisions. You, you tried to make it a family business, and at times, you know, your wife worked there, Marlene, who seems, by the way, like a saint, uh, <laughs> and is. you wanted, as you said, to, to have your... Hopefully to have some of your, you had your brother working there and you hope to have your children working there. But, but it sounded like often you had to make tough decisions. You had to part ways with some of these people who had been your partners uh, and in some cases never spoke to them again. Uh, what, what was that like for you and, and how do you feel about that well, thinking back and, it, and it, given all your success? It's terrible, but it's one of the things you have to go through sometimes. I'd like to talk about Tim McReynolds for uh, a second. Tim McReynolds was right out of law school when we had our first difficulties with uh, the Securities and Exchange Commissions. And because he had a lot of confidence in himself and because he had a unique way of trying to solve this problem, he saved us from going out of business. Now, this is an attorney only in business as an attorney for a couple of months, who had the ability to really save our business and and keep us running. A few years later, he changed the whole industry by thinking differently, by thinking irreverently about all the rules and regulations. So he went to the SEC to ask them if we could form an association with a commercial bank and just share commissions. And uh, the SEC uh, gave us a no action letter. If you do it exactly this way, we will take no action. That changed the whole industry. So again, he'd only been in business as an attorney for a couple of years, and he changed the whole securities industry. A little bit later, he saved me in my uh, fight with my partners (laughs) to uh, allow me to stay a partner in the brokerage firm that I'd helped uh, really kind of start because I was doing some obnoxious things relative to my partner's thoughts and judgments, and they really kind of wanted to uh, have me under their thumb or have me leave. So Tim was very, very important. So Tim was very near and dear to my soul, about as close as friend as you could possibly have. 
Now, when he really helped us with our legal work in 1975 and 76 with the Securities and Exchange Commission, we had a bill to him for $75,000. Now, that was a huge amount of money, more money than I could actually really comprehend. But I said to him, Tim, we can't afford to pay you because we don't have the money. What I would like to do is give you half of it in stock, and the other half will pay you over a period of time as we can. And of course, he had no choice but to agree because that's the only way he would get paid. So he had this stock now. So now he knows that our stock is increasing in value because we're keeping all of our earnings, putting them back into the business and growing the business. But every once in a while, he'd have uh, something uh, uh, grab his attention and he needed cash, and so he'd call me and want to sell his stock. Well, whenever I bought his stock, because we were the only market, I had to reduce our advertising, which was, to me, like cutting a hole in your heart and letting the blood flow out. So uh, after he did that a couple times, I said, Tim, I can't do this anymore. I'm, I'm going to buy all of your stock right now and get it done and get it over with and send you a check. So we parted ways. We weren't really mad at each other, but we, didn't, we lost that touch, that friendship. And uh, so he uh, and I were always friends later on in life, at, you know, at arm's length. So those are really hard times. Those are hard things. When I had to sue Bob Perlman, my mentor, that was hard. Mm. So I just really had to say to myself, don't let your emotions get in the way of good judgment. Try to think clearly, try to think logically, and follow the ideas that come out of that type of effort. And don't let your emotions become involved. But it, but I got to tell you, that's not easy. It's it's very difficult. Both of these men I loved, and I and I hated to go away from them with a uh, an arm's length uh, relationship. Have you found that that's sort of a standard occurrence in business in the history of successful businesses that there are people who come and go and. Uh, and, and there can be tough decisions having to be made along the way. Have you, sh- have you shared this with other entrepreneurs like yourself and discovered that they've had similar experiences? I've Yes. To answer your question, it's yes. Most of the time when I read stories of successful people, they generally had associations that was difficult for them to keep as the business grew because the two people would want to go different directions. And uh, so the friendship and the uh, camaraderie when you started the business is not there maybe five or ten years later. So I I find it not to be something that's abnormal to us, maybe normal for a new business getting started with more than one person, Uh, but it's something that you have to handle successfully or you won't survive. And so you were clearly driven to succeed. Um, I assume you've succeeded beyond your wildest dreams. Undoubtedly. Uh, uh, Has that changed your life? Uh, Could you have imagined it happening this way? Uh, I know you didn't want to merge with a bank, but eventually that did happen. Uh, And I know you wanted to leave the business for your children, your grandchildren, but that didn't happen. Um, So, you know, you accomplished... Many of your goals, but not all of your goals, and you're obviously a very wealthy man and beyond your wildest dreams. Is this like uh, the story of America uh, in the 20th and early 21st century? How are you feeling about your experience here, your narrative, your round trip? I think it certainly is true that I've accumulated more money than I ever dreamed or thought I would have. But... At the same time, I, I was old enough when that really happened that uh, I'm not going to change. So uh, my wife and I still have the same values that we had when we didn't have any money. <clears throat> it, it allows us to do things that we wouldn't have been able to do. For example, my children wanted to buy the baseball team, the Chicago Cubs. We would not have been able to do that with, without that kind of success. And it has made a wonderful business for my children to uh, uh, really run the baseball team. So we we have a living... I, mean, I think that had two paragraphs in your book about yeah. the baseball team, but obviously right. that's quite a momentous thing. It is a big thing, but my kids did it. 
um, they pushed the idea on me. I said, why would I want to buy a ball team? I have no interest. And basically they said, well, we don't want you to have interest, Dad. We want it for ourselves. We're all interested in baseball. So my wife had really taught the kids about baseball. And we got uh, the uh, television station WGN carrying the Chicago Cubs in the into the Omaha area. So my kids at home in the afternoon would watch it, and I did not know that. So my kids went up to Chicago, loving the Chicago Cubs, but I had no knowledge of it. So um, it was one of those things that's uh, serendipitous. It's, a, it's another one of those things where you can say the harder I work, the luckier I get. I had no interest in it, but my kids sure did. And they went after it in a very earnest way, and they did win a uh, world championship, as, as I think you know. First time for the Cubs in 100 years. So they've been very successful with the baseball team. They've been very successful with the remodeling of the, of the ballpark and the, neighbor, and the businesses around it. So it's been a very wonderful thing for us, and we would not have been able to do that if we hadn't had the fortune that came with uh, being successful at the brokerage business. Is the Ricketts family uh, heroes in Chicago by because of buying the team and taking my GM from Boston <laughs> to to uh, get yourself a championship just like you got one or two or three or four for us? I I, I think my son. Well, first of all, uh, my wife and I have four children. They were the ones that uh, did buy the Cubs. It was suggested by my son Tom, and my Tom my son Tom had the most interest. And he has an entrepreneurial bent. So the uh, four kids among themselves put Tom in charge. So that was uh, really, he, he was the one that was to make all the important decisions. So in Chicago, when we won the uh, World Series, I think my son could have, Tom could have been elected to anything. I think everybody would have said he, he should be uh, president of the United States, he should be mayor, he should be anything. So uh, every, everybody has respect for what has happened. And uh, my family, my three, three uh, kids uh, that still live in Chicago are well regarded. So I want to touch on uh, probably something a little more personal and, and yeah. sensitive, and that is uh, you had a, a brother who was gay and died of AIDS. You have a daughter who is gay. Um, you come from a Catholic background. Uh, you grew up in the Midwest, obviously, uh, you know, uh, has this been a, a you, you're very forthright about it in the book. It's very honorable the way you discuss it all and handle it. Is, what has that experience been like for you and for your children and growing up the way you did? Well, obviously, I think you can uh, imagine that growing up in a town of about 6,000 uh, in an agricultural community that you don't have much exposure to the thought or idea or the reality of a homosexual. It, it just doesn't, it doesn't come into your well-being. <clears throat> I never had an idea that my brother was gay until he called me and told me he had uh, AIDS, as I describe in the book. Mm. So, but he was only a year younger than I was, and so I loved him. Uh, it didn't make any difference to me uh, whether he had AIDS or whether he had been a homosexual. Uh, so we took care of him and, until he passed away. My daughter was, um, she was in her early 20s. She was a young woman when she came to uh, my wife and I to tell us that she was gay. And, um, you know, she said, I did not choose this. Nobody would wish upon themselves that they be gay. And I was born this way. So, you know, through my tears, uh, I was able to uh, tell her never take second place. Always hold your head high and and be as good as you can be at at whatever you want to be. Uh, that both of those things with my brother and with my daughter come out of love. You, you, the love is, is probably the strongest emotion in, in, in a person's life and certainly the strongest connector to, to other people. Family is the basic unit of society. And, and if your society is going to work, families have got to work. Um, my wife and I both came from very strong families, very different type of families, but uh, very strong. And so uh, the family uh, came first. So those decisions were really automatic on my part. Uh, I know that a lot, uh, in a lot of other families, they're not 
uh, considered that way, and I think that's really a shame, and that's part of why I talked about it in this book. I could have left both of those things out, and the book still would have been good, but, but I think it's important to let people know that, you know, there's a good percentage of our, our population that are gay, and the fact that they are gay doesn't, shouldn't have any influence on any other aspect of their business. So um, I, I really kind of wanted to tell those stories in that book. Uh, thank you for discussing that. Yeah. Uh, so I wanted to ask you about advertising, because advertising was <laughs> such a big part of your business, and you put a lot of money into it. Uh, you clearly took pride in, in, in the benefits of driving uh, uh, customer volumes through your advertising. What do you think about the advertising of TD Ameritrade today? Well, I am still a large shareholder of TD Ameritrade. And, I know. And I, I really enjoy the fact that I think they still have good management. And I would, I would like to tell this to the management today, too. I think that ad that you've got running has been on too long. It's old. It, it's, it's boring. But I, they must have a reason for continuing it. But do I like it? No, I, got it t I would have liked it two years ago, but I don't like it now. Yeah, it seems a little long in the tooth. I'm not quite sure where they're going with it these days. But it is ubiquitous, and it's memorable, although I don't know quite why I remember it or what it gets me to do. Uh, uh, and, and do you have a view of, you know, you know Schwab uh, market cap is about $70 billion in year to $22 billion, and E-Trade, God love it, still around, is about 7 or $8 billion. What's the dynamic in the industry now why is Schwab at such a, a higher valuation than Ameritrade? Although clearly, you know, it's beyond well beyond anything you ever could have imagined. I assume. Well, uh, Chuck Schwab, who's a friend, but at the time we were competing all through, uh, you know, seventy-five up uh, th through the turn of the century. He was a competitor that I just had to worry about, and I mentioned him, uh, mentioned that company several times in my book, but. He was fortunate enough to have started in California. California, I think at that time, had the ninth largest economy in the world if it had been its own country. Now, in Nebraska, we had a million and a half people. And most of them didn't buy and sell stocks and bonds. So he had a market that was right out at, at his front door, and I had to have a market where I had to go searching through the haystack to find people that would want to be uh, interested in buying and selling stocks and bonds. So, uh, although I think he started in about 1975, I'd never really heard of the discount broker Schwab and Company in San Francisco until about 1977. And uh, the, uh, he, he also wrote a book, I, I think we're both published within the same month, um, and um, if, you, if you read his book, you, you see that although he had the opportunity of being closer to a market that was uh, larger than the market that, that I was in, that uh, he wanted to uh, grow uh, as fast as he could with branches, and those branches are uh, expensive. So I think Chuck Schwab has done a wonderful job all through the years of managing his business and allowed him to get to a larger market cap than uh, Ameritrade just because of where we started and what we had to deal with when uh, we were uh, a new company and, and getting uh, uh, to uh, to grow. He had a bigger base to grow from just because of the population and the kind of population that he had. And he also bought a, a bank, right? I mean, didn't he buy a private wealth management business? He did somewhere uh, along the line, yes. Uh, yes, yes. I, I, I got to tell you, Bill, every entrepreneur is going to have to make mistakes because you're doing things that have never been done before. So anybody can look at Chuck Schwab and they can look at Joe Ricketts and on any particular interest they can say, oh, that was a bad thing, and, and they're probably right. So uh, you have to take your hat off. You have to give a lot of credit to Chuck Schwab for doing some of the things that didn't work. By the same token, I have to say to myself, I deserve credit for being brave even though I failed. And that's normal when, you're, uh, when you've got a growing business. And do you have a view on sort of the market these days? It's uh, obviously at all-time highs. 
you know, sort of month after month. Uh, w- w- I'm sure people would like to know your views of where you think this market is going. Well, I'm 78 years old, and I'm still working 40 to 60 hours a week. Now, I did retire from Ameritrade uh, as uh, CEO uh, about 20 years ago, and I figured I deserved to take use of the money that I had accumulated to do the things that I wanted. And that kept me happy for about six months. After six months, I was no longer happy. I, I have to be in business. I have to be a part of the creative process that makes economies work. So I went back to work, and now I'm very happy. And i got to tell you, I have never worked in such a strong economy as exists today. Mm. I think it is uh, really quite wonderful for the country It's a little bit awkward for me because I'm not in the brokerage business. I'm off in other businesses, and as I try to buy other businesses, there's a lot of money floating around, and there's a lot of competition, which kind of makes the prices kind of ridiculous sometimes. So you kind of have to uh, pass. But uh, the uh, government has really given the uh, uh, country the attitude that, uh, hey, times are good. You know, the president uh, led the charge on reducing taxes and reducing regulations, and I think those are two important things. And if I could, I'd like to get on my soapbox and say again, there are still too many government regulations on the part of the federal, state, and local levels that, uh, you know, just really stop people from starting their own businesses. And that's what makes our uh, economy grow. That's what makes our wealth so good. But on the other hand, you say in your book that you support regulation, or at least in the securities yeah. industry. I mean, I guess it's well, the same as like having a seatbelt in a car, maybe. Well, a seatbelt in a car would be going too far for regulations. I don't think we need if people. I don't so think you don't think I don't, you should have a seatbelt in a car. <laughs> well, I don't think so. I I, I feel like huh. I shouldn't have to be told what to do. But now the the other argument is, if I get in a car wreck without a seatbelt, and I end up on the, the uh, charity list for helping me get well, I, I was negligent and not wearing a seatbelt. So I, I see both items, but my feelings are, leave me alone. Let, I'll, I'll make up my own mistakes. I'll go my own way and do my own thing. That's my emotions. Realistically, you know that there has to be some regulation. I like the word free enterprise more than I like yes, the word yeah. capitalism. Uh, capitalism is a great thing. But capitalism really kind of gives the image that it's unbounded, that, that it's really raw, and it's dog-eat-dog dog and cutthroat, which it is and which it should be. But free enterprise may give the same image, but brings in the temperance that comes with regulation. So we do need regulation. We do need an overseer of the securities industry, probably every industry, to make sure that the balance between the consumer and the people that are offering the products and services are offering them in an honest and a a, a good way. So we do need some regulation. The question is always, how far do you go? My personal feelings is both on the part of cities and municipalities and states and federal, we've gone too far. We've tried to protect the public too much to the point where we're stopping people from starting their own businesses And when people start their own businesses, that's where we create the new jobs that are necessary to make our economy get along well. So I think we've probably gone a little bit too far. Well, on that very optimistic note, uh, I want to thank Joe Ricketts for being part of this uh, program today and to tell everybody this is an amazing story of entrepreneurship, persistence, truly the American dream, uh, written uh, in a very readable way. Congratulations to you and your co-writer, who, Thank you, you. who you gave kudos to. It's really a great read, and I recommend it. I really appreciate Thank that. You. Thanks very kindly. Thanks for listening to this week's Afterwards. Please rate and subscribe to us wherever you get your podcasts.